Hello, and welcome to Forget What You Learned, a place for families to stop and reflect on the modern state of education. We empower you to challenge your own thinking about today's traditional school system and ask the question, are my kids thriving? I'm Corey Greenberg, a parent in the trenches just like you, and I chat with innovators, experts, and other parents who are changing the conversation, inspiring families to reevaluate how we define academic success. This podcast is brought to you by Pacific Preparatory and Tutor Corps, sister organizations molding education through innovative one-on-one learning for students in today's digital world. In today's episode, we're talking about neurodiversity within our traditional education system, and especially what it's like for kids who are considered twice exceptional, or 2E. If you haven't heard the term before, 2E kids have what can be a really challenging, puzzling mix of both learning differences and giftedness. Our guest today, Sam Young, is himself 2E and shares his own story of surviving school and how it inspired him to return to the classroom and then start his own company to support the unique needs of 2E kids. Overall though, we dive into the deficit-based outdated approach of our current system. And Sam offers some startlingly simple insights into why it just does not work for 2E kids, let alone the masses. This is not a depressing episode though, don't worry. Sam actually has some salve for the burn because what he's doing is both inspiring and hopeful. This one isn't to be missed. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today's episode is about students who are considered twice exceptional, or 2E. I must admit that I hadn't heard the term until about a year, year and a half ago, and my guess is there are a lot of parents out there who haven't either, and may even have a 2E kiddo without knowing there's a way to describe the special concoction of abilities and challenges they see on a daily basis. I will let our guest today describe what a 2E kiddo could look like, but the very gist is someone with high academic aptitude and who struggles with learning or behavioral challenges, things like ADHD, autism, dyslexia, or anxiety, for example. These kids are very bright, and this sometimes masks their specific struggles, and sometimes they present at home and in school settings as a bit of a puzzle that nobody can figure out. The reason I want to talk about 2E kids is to have a broader conversation about neurodiversity within our traditional education system. How is the system as a whole meeting the needs of neurodiverse learners, especially as our understanding of their challenges broadens? Our special education system has been deficit-based for so long, and the question is, what should we be doing instead? So without further ado, to help us answer some of these questions is my guest, Sam Young, who describes himself as twice exceptional, yet I'd argue he's about 50 times exceptional. Uh, Sam is a growth-minded, two-time Fulbright Scholar and director of Young Scholars Academy, a strengths-based, talent-focused virtual enrichment center that supports twice exceptional, neurodivergent, and gifted students and their families. Sam is a neurodivergent educator who has ADHD. As an ADHD learner, he has a tremendous understanding of experience in and respect for all things related to neurodiverse education. Before founding Young Scholars Academy, Sam taught in a variety of capacities at an array of programs in the U.S., Europe, and Asia. Travel and culture are near and dear to him, and he has led 2E students to over seven countries for immersive cultural and educational trips. So Sam has also been featured in documentaries, textbooks, magazines, and over 20 podcasts, 10 seminars, and many other publications. Hi, Sam. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Corey. I'm excited to be here. Can we start with getting a bit personal? That's okay. Can you... Can you talk about your experience, like first as a neurodiverse learner yourself, going through school? What was school like for you? Yeah, it's, um, it is a a good place to start. I, I, when I was young, I always loved 
learning. I love learning and I love sharing. I love once I learned something, I couldn't wait to help someone else figure it out. Um, but I always struggled with like certain kinds of learning. It was really clear pretty early. I think I got diagnosed with ADHD in fourth grade. And I was always the one that like when desks, like it was like, you know, two spots next to the teacher's desk. Right. And they're for the kids, like the trouble kid. I was always <laughs> was like third grade on my desk was adjacent to or touching the teacher's desk. Um, so that was kind of a part of my journey. And then it just, it as as like reading and production became more and more a part of school, right? You kind of hit that third grade ceiling of all of a sudden there's more ramping and then we start changing classes and it started to get harder and harder for me to do certain things like that. Like I could really show up in conversations and discussions and I had strong opinions about things that might be like pretty advanced for someone my age. But when it came to like reading, if it's something said like there to there in a textbook, like I couldn't figure out, did the author make a mistake? And I would get caught up on kind of the low hanging like syntactical things and, and I, I phonics and things like that were really difficult for me. So from an early age, I kind of had like a lower kind of self-esteem around being a student. And, mm-hmm. and then that bled into home because it just took me longer. Like, why can't I focus? Why can't I just get things done? And my neighbors are playing street hockey and I want to be out there, but I have to finish and mm-hmm. the finishing never happens or happens too late to go out. Oh my goodness. I, um, I feel like that describes probably a lot of kids experiences. And I wonder like, what was the school's response? What were your parents response to your struggles like that? Especially because like you said, you were very bright and you were showing up. My guess is the teachers loved you, but they also were like, I'm frustrated because you're not getting it. So like, what did the schools do with you? (laughs) I, yeah, I mean, so one would be like, put me next to the teacher, kind mm-hmm. of keep a hand on me. Um, mm-hmm. And, and I think my, my, yeah, my teachers were really supportive. Like they understood that there was like a gap and they didn't exactly maybe understand where it came from, but they always like invested in me and they would let me hang out after class and write things down that I maybe couldn't have focused on during class or um, they would let me come in early and, and try to catch up on things. And my mom was like a rock star at home. So I would get home and we would sit down and try to make sense of everything. And she would read certain things to me or help me because I could get it. Like I understood it. It's just my, I was just so slow and it was so difficult. Um, and I, you know, it wasn't until I became an adult that I realized, well, my dad has ADHD and my dad was mm. dyslexic. And, um, you know, he was like in the 1950s was sent to military school. Mm-hmm. Right. So because like there wasn't really what do you do? And and I looked at all these pictures of my dad when he was a child and every picture they're like holding his hands by his side. Like he's just mm. he wants to move and do things. And I think I was just kind of like that. Um, and my mom was really good about getting me like a phonics tutor. Um, and I would go to like writing seminars and things like that to try to help organize all the things that were happening in my head and, you know, slow them down and build structure around them so that I could communicate them to other people. I mean, that's amazing that you had that support system. And it sounds like actually, you know, some pretty targeted interventions, like they did understand what you were capable of, but at the same time, you know, those extra supports that you needed. Um, How did you come to understand the term 2E and like, and did you have an aha moment of, oh yeah, that's actually me? Yeah, that's an interesting one. So I, and and again, I'm sort of painting like a, there's a lot of ugliness in this story, right? There's a lot of difficulty. Um, If this were more than a 30 minute podcast, I would share some stories, but (laughs) I, yeah, I don't want to paint it overly rosy. Like I I think that, you know, when we talk about, and we'll get into this as we talk more about 2E, but like, you know, when we kind of plot people like a scatter plot, right? You can see like we lend different directions and we might be out towards the fringes and really above average abilities. And then we might kind of be towards the center with some of our like struggle areas. And for me, like interpersonal communication um, was an intrapersonal communication. We're always stronger. Like I was kind of talking to myself a lot about some of the things that were going on and I could talk to other people about it. So I was, even though I didn't know like what advocating was, I was able to say like, I need help. Um, and, and that probably made my story a little rosier than most because of the way in which I'm strong and the way in which I struggle are both kind of pronounced. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Like this kid's yeah. struggling to read. 
but he keeps coming every day after class because his mom's making him, you know? And right. so like, it was easier and my hand was up, you know, help me. Yeah. Um, not everyone does that. Not everyone can have that experience. So um, that just to provide a little bit more context, as far as my, my journey into 2E, um, you know, so I was always knew I wanted to work with students who had learning differences and I was teaching at different schools. I first started on the East coast and then I moved to the Bay area and I was teaching um, and I was really trying to find like my direction and how, who was I going to show up for and how was I going to show up? And I went to this, um, uh, teacher fair and all the tables were in this, this horseshoe, right? So left to right, everyone's going in left to right. Like we're kind of trained to do that. Right. And so we're going to go over here and everyone's going, and I was like, I'm going to go right to left. I'm going to go over here. So I do all the tables backwards and I'm kind of talking to the different people and, and, um, I'm staying with a friend I'm down in Los Angeles. I live in, 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 in the Bay Area at the time. And I go back to his car. And I was like, oh, man, this was a really busy day. I'm so sorry you had to wait. He waited in his car for like three hours for me. He drove me from the airport to this place. And then I spent the weekend with him. He said, did you see every school? I said, no. I went to almost all of them. And he said, well, shouldn't you see the rest? I was like, well, if you're okay with it. So I went back in. And the last school, which was the first school, actually, if I went the right way, was Bridges, Bridges Academy. Mm -hmm. And so I met uh, the headmaster, Carl Sabatino, and it was kind of like speed dating. You know, it was like, hey, are you free at 1.30? I was like, well, sure. And <laughs> so we like then go to this other table and we talk further and sort of describing 2E to me. And I had gone to, you know, I had a degree in, in education. So I knew about like students who had learning differences and I knew about students who had gifts. And the thought that they could coexist was like mind blowing to me. It gave mm -hmm. me so much understanding, not of me right away, because we're often late to the party when it comes to like our self-reflection, but yeah. I can talk about like my dad and like mm. students I taught. And I was like, Oh my, God. like my dad was this artist and he was so talented and all these things and, and he could never get it together. And he didn't have like executive functions, but he was both. And like this light bulb went off and then I was like, wait, maybe I, I, <laughs> and, and, and then it just kind of made sense. So I went and saw bridges and met the kids. and I was like, wow. And, the rest was kind of history. I felt like I sort of found my, my tribe. And then there was, you know, I could spend forever talking about it, but there was opportunity to like le kind of level up and then get involved in research and then a graduate school and, and, and so on. And it just made sense. It was like teaching younger versions of me and the, ad some adults that I had become very close to, which also then made sense. I was like, Oh, no wonder I hang out with like all these quirky adults, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, quirky is a good way to describe it. I mean, I think that's how, you know, the, in layman's terms, how kids and adults who are 2E are sort of described, you know, like, um, and it's good to know just for people who don't know that Bridges is a school specifically for kids who are t 2E, correct? Yes. Yeah, Bridges yeah. is really kind of the flagship school. They've been around for about 20 years for, for like, they were really kind of one of the first schools in that space committed to this population of you know, gifted and, right, mm -hmm. um, or learning difference to and. And then the term TUI gave this understanding of they weren't gifted and learning disabled. They were duly exceptional. They have these two mm -hmm. exceptions. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, that's something that you focus on a lot. I want to dive into, you know, the deficit-based model and what you think that we need to move towards in, in our traditional education system. Do you want to dive into that? heavy, heavy topic. Yeah, that's a big <laughs> one. Wow. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm happy to talk deficit and strength based all day, but the first thing that needs to happen in like the education system is smaller classes, right? Like, yes, I, I, I can already hear there's always naysayers like, yeah, that sounds great. I, and I'll speak at conferences and I'll, I'll have this like really incredible, you know, ideal, right? And someone's like, I have 42 kids in my class. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's a failure of our system. Like you cannot mm -hmm. do what I'm talking about with 42 kids in the class. I don't even know how you do anything with 42 kids in the class. That could be 42 kids should be a whole school. Yeah. <laughs> um, yep. uh, so, so let me just say that as a caveat, but yeah, I mean, the biggest thing that, that we do, and it, it's both harmful systemically and personally um, is th the deficit based model, which is essentially this idea that we need to kind of bring the bottom up. Like mm -hmm. that we need to like fix our kids, right? So 
we're kind of, you know, we're plotting them and so-and-so is a little slower, not turning in work, et cetera. We need to like fix that part um, as a society, as, as an individual, as a school. And what we do is we end up reinforcing the not so pleasant feelings, right? We, mm-hmm. we reinforce the I'm broken. There's something wrong with me. I, I can't do X, Y, Z. And that both is not intelligent as a society, right? We should be taking like our, our bright, curious, different minds and developing their bright, curious differences rather than trying to make them kind of converge to the means, right? And, and this is, again, I also think that one of the big changes that needs to happen is this idea that education is really a bit outdated, right? Like, yeah. yes, we have these large class sizes, but also, you know, Taylorism, right? Like the most of the education system was built to, to ready young people to go into factories, right? At the yes. turn of the century. Yes. And that was about maximum efficiency. When should the bell ring? How long can we stay at one task before we have to rotate? It's not really, we're not uh, an industrial country here in the United States anymore. Um, we're an intellectual country and we're in an, an intellectual era. And I don't know that school is necessarily stimulating our intellect and developing our strength so much as it's trying to kind of get us to, to line up and queue up and, 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 and kind of fix us. So the opposite of the deficit part is the, is the strength part. Yes, that is a conversation we um, have had and will be continuing to have. It's, it's actually the theme of this podcast, which is exactly what you said, that we are operating under this factory model um, where we're trying to get, and it's all so outcome-based, you know, and the outcome is just for kids to go to college and to get a job. And the truth is, I think it's 87% of adults are dissatisfied with their jobs, you know, and we can't, we can't raise kids in the factory model and then want them to go work for Google. Mm -hmm. You know, we need those like out of the box, creative um, thinkers and a two E kid who, you know, is incredibly brilliant. And and if given the opportunity to be creative um, and not to focus on sitting still and completing, you know, a math worksheet with 40 problems on it. uh, It's, it's just doing all of us a disservice. Like you're saying. Yeah. And if you think about it, I mean, just from like, a, what does a good leader do? A good leader finds the talents and strengths of a team and appoints the people to the right position. Mm-hmm. Right. But education has kind of missed that. And if we have a kid, I mean, it's so obvious when you look at animals, right? Like if I had a goldfish and I was like, okay, goldfish, you need to go climb that tree. Um, and that's how you get an A, right? Or like, okay, crow, uh, you need to be able to dive really deep and, and grab some seaweed or kelp. Like these are, these are nonsensical tasks uh, just because they're both animals and they might even be the same age doesn't mean that they should do the same things or be expected to be uh, decent at them, right? And I think back a lot to this. There's this book I love. I recommend everyone reads it. I have my seniors read it when they get ready to leave. It's called The Big Leap. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's this idea of that we sort of have these quadrants. Um, There's the sort of your incompetence area, right, which would be like your struggles. Then there's your competence. You're no better or worse than anyone else, but you're just there. Then there's your excellence, which is an area in which others might see value in you and task you to do certain things, but it doesn't fill you up. It's not like where you're glowing and where you're flowing. And then there's the zone of genius. This is the space in which we're like thriving, right? For me, it's like creating and connecting. If you want me to do a spreadsheet, like that's H-E double hockey sticks for me. Like that is, <laughs> that's not good. Like it's, it's not gonna be good for anyone, right? And so if you were to evaluate me in an Excel class, I took an Excel class in grad school. It was horrible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I'm glad I learned, but I don't know that I did. I mean, I just kind of got by and leaned on other people. I used my interpersonal skills to help other people help me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to have a meaningful society and to have fulfilled citizens, we, we should develop people's strengths and figure out how can you live a happy life? How are you going to feel fulfilled? How are you going to lose track of time? What is the content that you're interested in? What are the, the ways in which you like to work and add value? And then let's figure out how that person can develop those things so they can be an even better version of that, right? Yeah. For themselves, so they feel that affect and for everyone else because we all benefit. Yeah. 
Yeah, I I mean that sounds that sounds ideal. Um it also sounds very difficult to change. Um and you know, there's this idea of differentiated learning, right, which kind of is speaking to you what you're saying also. It's like how do we how do we let the kids access their learning in different you know, in terms of their ability. So if they're really struggling with math, then we we might need to use certain strategies or classroom makeup or whatnot. And then in other subjects, they may be at a different place. So how does how does our system that exists the way it exists, where you drop off your kid and they're in a classroom full of however many kids the same age, how do this has the school system manage or get at differentiated learning? Like, is it even possible? In yeah, our I mean, it, it is like, I don't want to say, oh, it's all doom and gloom mm-hmm. because it depends on the goal. So I always say like, um, you know, understanding by design is like one of my favorite education principles. Uh, this idea that we just like, reverse engineer, right? Instead of just teaching something, it's like, well, where do we want them to end? Right? I teach a, a lot of my seniors, like one of the questions I ask, so this, this sounds like doom and gloom. I'm like, how do you want to die? You know, oh, like gosh, that's what, Sam. <laughs> that that's that's life design, right? Like, how yeah. do you want to be living the the last period of your life? And then, what's it going to take to get there? I'm not interested mm-hmm. in what you want to do in college next year. Mm-hmm. That's short sighted. What are you going to major in? I don't know. Me either. Mm-hmm. What do you want to do when you die? Oh, I would like. I want, I want hundreds of people celebrating the the contributions that I make to education. Mm. Okay, what do you have to do to get there? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's the same in education. You know, what do we want our students to do? What's the goal is the key to differentiation? Do I want kids to write? Maybe I can let go of the content or do I want them to understand the role that women played in World War One? Okay. Mm -hmm. once I'm clear on that, I have a certain benchmark. Then what are the ways in which the kids can have as much choice? Right. The two P's product and process. Mm -hmm. How can they have as much choice as possible? to do something. So instead of me saying, all right, everyone, you have to write this essay on women in World War One. What if I do like a tic-tac-toe? Okay, you have to do three of these things. Mm-hmm. Um, you can write out, you can do a podcast, you can uh, look at women's fashion during rationing and the roles in which they had to play. We can look at women in different countries, whatever it might be. And when we get really clear on what we want, we can kind of let go of how it comes to pass because not everyone is going to write an essay or be good at it. And that's Mm -hmm. okay too. Like, yes. Are there non-negotiables? Perhaps, right? Should people know the alphabet? Probably. But I think we can let go a little bit. And even in a big class, you give everyone 12 choices for a project instead of we all do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Also more interesting for the teacher when they're grading it, right? Like they, you know, allowing there to be that creativity and the student's voice coming through as opposed to just kind of a cookie cutter, everyone's doing the same thing. That That's like the spice of life right there. Mm-hmm. Or have the kids grade it. Mm, right. Have, yep. Why don't you have them make a rubric? Well, well, if our goal is understanding the role of women in World War One, what what is a good presentation, paper, podcast, documentary? What are like the six non-negotiables? Maybe you have a rubric and have them make it mm-hmm. or you make it and have them score it. Yeah. I mean, again, that sounds amazing. Uh, and I I think that there are schools out there that are innovating and doing this differently. I mean, you know, it, you, there's schools like ours, Pacific Preparatory, that's one-on-one, which means it's all about that student. But you know, we're just a tiny, tiny niche in the in the world of education there. But there are other schools and other models out there looking at this, right? Uh, yeah, I think it can be done in any which way you can open up the hood and decide, you know, we're going to pull the whole engine and we're going to rebuild this thing. Or you can say we're just going to change the oil. But either way, yeah. you're making a step in the right direction, whether it's just opening up more options and more inroads. Mm-hmm. Um I like to think of almost like a like a ring of of earth uh, of, of of land, right? We're all sort of on this ring, and in the middle is like kind of like this crater, and like in the very center, there's like a concept or a goal or an objective, and the kids can enter however they want. Like you can like fly, you can you know slide, <laughs> you can build a bridge, you know whatever is going to get you there um, is the goal, and then we kind of build scaffolding you know, along the way. So yeah, I mean, look, if it's 45 kids, probably not gonna have time to make a rubric. 
You're probably yeah. not going to have time to have them all be grading, but maybe we just have different options for the project. And that's a, that's a killer start. Well, and it just made me think of, you know, the way special education works today. Um, if we were to to change the model to to what you're describing, you know, all of a sudden there's a little less pressure on kids that learn differently to, uh, you know, get to that middle point, right? Like, like we can honor their gifts and we can nurture those while not just grabbing them and just yanking them towards, you know, this invisible finish line, right? Is that part of it too? I mean, it really would, I think it would really shift the idea of special education services. Yeah. And, and again, kind of moving away from some, some of the standardization of, yes, of, uh, you know, having kids all have to do X, Y, Z, because it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And, and we can still have goals we just kind of have to rework them like what what's mm-hmm. the 21st century student need to be able to do you know maybe like everyone should be proficient in me- in media bias testing and and you know things like yeah. that you still hold yeah, students that's a to big a high... issue that's happening yeah <laughs> at the right moment. like with um, ai and chat can you and all this stuff yeah can you talk a little bit about what you do at young scholars academy because and i and i will tell anyone who's listening the way that I know Sam is that uh, you know we work with kids who learn differently through Pacific Preparatory, and because it's a one-on-one program, you know they do need socialization. They need to see other kids, and they especially need to connect with other kids who might who they might have a shared experience with. You know, which is I I, I feel a little bit different from my peers. So you provide this really safe space for kids to come as they are and to connect with one another and build relationships. Like, can you just talk about how that piece came to be and what is it like? I feel like PAC prep and YSA are like the PB and J of supporting differently wired kids, you know, because you guys have this incredible model of this one-to-one ultimate scaffold differentiated, like learner-based journey, which is building around the child. And and then we have this this idea that we have sort of cohorts of like strength based interest areas where mm-hmm. our students are coming together. And the big idea is that we have what I call like the X and the Y axis. We have small classes of six or eight kids, um, 100% virtual, so from all over the states and the world. And then we have the often neurodivergent, quirky mentors. And it's that combo of having our students do what they love in a place where they can build confidence and build self esteem. And look around and say, like, holy cow, I'm not the only person like this. I'm not the only person who wants to talk about railroads until my jaw hurts, you know, and I'm seven years old. And there's just something about finding that space and making friends. So many of our students have been bullied and have had pretty traumatic experiences because of their asynchronies, right? Because mm-hmm. they have these big gaps, they have high uh, intelligence, uh, curiosity, etc. And with that, are going to develop ahead of their you know, their cohort, their similarly aged cohort. And that makes them, makes them different. And, and, and different can be difficult um, for a lot of our students. And then when you steep them in an environment of other kids who are also different than unique like they are, they just feel like seen and supported and normal, actually. Yeah, it's incredibly powerful um, to have that sense of community when it may be hard to kind of find their people in their local classroom, in their, you know, on the soccer pitch and all those things. But what you're offering is this like global community where, and, and I don't know, I'm picturing myself as one of, you know, the kids in YSA and thinking, okay, there's that kid that I really connect with. And the, the possibility that there's other people out there I haven't even met yet who I could connect with, like it must leave these kids feeling very hopeful. Yeah. Can I share like two 30 second stories? Please, please. Okay. okay. So one, this mom, um, we had like an open house three weeks ago or so. And this mom coined this term, which I love. It's called like the YSA glow. And Mm. she's like, my son has this 24 hour YSA glow. Like after he leaves improv, he's just like feeling good. Like he's just warm and radiant. And then that lasts for 24 hours because he spends an hour in an improv class doing like silly golem voices and things and you know the other kids are doing it too and they just love it um and and then another thing i wanted to share is 
uh, so that we started our new semester this week and I was, I've been, uh, you know, going in every class and I observe and make sure everything's going well. And uh, I noticed a trend across like six of our classes, the kids would, someone at some point would say, oh, well, I have ADHD or I know this is for 2E kids or I'm autistic. And someone else is like, no, I have autism. Oh, and, yeah. and then like, you know, all of a sudden you get six, six out of seven kids or something. I have autism and ADHD and, you know, and, and then they're all like, they're bragging about it. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, I mean, I could cry. It's just like the warmest the thing that the thing that maybe puts a target on their back like anywhere else is like braggadocious <laughs> it's, it's yeah. like they're a badge of honor yeah and i think that's so special oh my goodness talk about a glow i mean yeah i get the warm fuzzies too just thinking about it um because the, you know the the dark side that we didn't really touch on is that a lot of these kids really do feel isolated and alone and disconnected. So um, I think what you're doing and anyone who's doing this kind of work in their local communities should be encouraged and spotlighted because it's, it's really, you know, there's, there's the mental health crisis that I've talked about a little bit on this podcast. It's out there. And so any ways that we can support our kids when they may not be supported within their school system, um, just the system as a whole. Ooh, it's what we need for sure. Absolutely. And again, whether there's 45 kids in a class, you're not a teacher, et cetera, like just a little step forward, <clears throat> just challenging at an IEP meeting. If everything is about fixing, you know, just mm-hmm. what, what are they into? What do they love? What fills them up? You know, just little, that's a win. Like that's progress. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, let's go to the lightning round. I always like to like lighten things up a little bit before we wrap up. So this is um, lightning round brought to you by Corey and Sam. Uh, The first question is, what's your favorite um, education or parenting book? I've got two. Can I say two? Yeah, of course. Is that lightning? Okay. Number parenting would be Debbie Reber's Differently Wired. Mm-hmm. And uh, education would be neurodiversity by um, what Tom Armstrong, Thomas Armstrong. Okay, we'll put those in the show notes for people to check out. Uh, okay, number two, what do you do in your free time, Sam? Mm-hmm. That's a great question. I love to be active. Um, I mean, working uh, at a computer all day, my my body craves, you know, moving and things. So I like to. Um, hike and and go to the gym and I, I, I'm a big surfer and I love working on engines I find that very calming so I love like motorcycles and classic cars are a money pit hobby for me oh okay how did you learn how to do that like fix stuff fix engines actually kind of a funny story I so I have a mentor who helps me he uh, we both have 1956 Chevy pickup trucks oh um, but I actually built my truck with a bunch of 2e students I just decided I'm going to take this thing apart and rebuild it. Would anyone want to join? And so I did that with a group of like six kids over two years. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. Number three, this is a one word answer. What do children in this world need more of? Strengths. Strengths. I love that. All right. Number four, what's your favorite feel good song? I would have to say, and I'm not good at song names, but, um, oh goodness. You're going to have to sing it now. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wants that. You're going to lose listeners. Um, <laughs> let me get, let me come back to that one. I actually can't think of the artist's name either right now. Okay. Actually, I'm going to save you here because I have a feel good song that has been in my head all day. It was in my workout this morning and it's been stuck in my head. I want to dance with somebody by Whitney Houston stuck in my head literally all day. That's good. That is a good uh, one. Okay. Number five, last one. If you could summon anything to your desk right now with like a magic button, what would it be? Mm, this is a great question. I would say a yo-yo. Oh, okay. Oh, yo-yos are very trendy right now. 
Are they, uh, are they, have they come full circle? Are they cool? Again? Yes. Yes. My 11 year old's really good at the yo-yo. You know, oh. that's the, the advent of YouTube. There's all kinds of yo-yo tricks and everything. So. Um, I, I remembered my artist, by the way, Rufus Del Sol. Okay. Um, I can't remember the song that I like, but I love Rufus. Okay. Good. Very good. Well, Sam, the last question is, where can people find you? I know we've talked about Young Scholars. Um, where can people find you? And is there anything you want to share about anything exciting coming up for you? Yes. So if you head on over to our site, youngscholarsacademy.org, you'll see some of our amazing courses that are enrolling. And this is a fantastic time to do so, actually, because we have some incredible community events for parents and some belonging and some amazing enrichment-based courses. Awesome. We will put um, all of that information for you in the show notes. And Sam, it is always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, I just always, I walk away from our conversations with the warm fuzzies because of what you're doing and what you bring to it. And I am just really honored to have you on the podcast today. Thank you, Corey. You are the hostess with the mostest, and I always feel the same with you. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forget What You Learned, hosted by me, Corey Greenberg. As always, our goal is to allow you to zoom out on the snapshot of your family's life and answer the question, are my kids thriving? We're here to inspire you to make those small and maybe big changes to answer yes. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Pacific Preparatory and Tutor Corps sister organizations committed to educating students with an innovative and holistic approach in today's digital world. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and leave a rating and review. See you next time.